edit it. Everything that matched Troy's statement was shown them. That matched mine. Because I know it's was it's edited out. And I think maybe one of the things we want to do is show the judge specifically how where these, you know, little five minute segments of look, this tape says this and then show him it isn't in this tape. And this is the tape the grand jury saw. I'm going to attempt to get these tapes and we'll see what happens next. But to obtain the evidence, De Camp must approach some of the very officials he believes were involved in the cover up. The county attorney's office which ran the grand jury. In the good old Alicia Olin case, 127-194, I'm trying to get the evidence, the tapes and the transcripts of Troy and Danny, Troy, uh, Troy Bonick. It might be downstairs. Can we get that up here once? Yeah. I think there's two tapes. There should be, as I understand, and the transcript of them. But if I could get them, uh, I could start reviewing them and figure out maybe a little a little bit on what's happening on some things. Except at the county attorneys, they have all the bills up there. Oh. Uh, Robert, uh, let me guess, Robert Siegler has them. Robert Siegler is the prosecuting attorney fighting to send Alicia Owen back to prison. After lengthy negotiations, the camp emerges with the tapes the grand jury never saw. $4,000 or about $4,000 of cocaine. Okay, and what airline? I flew out of America. Okay, and uh, did you go direct? No, I had to do was a stopover in Denver. No, it was a stopover in Dallas Fort Worth. So you went from where to where to where? I went from Omaha to Dallas Fort Worth, uh, like an hour, and then uh, a big, big plane from uh, Dallas to. Los Angeles. Did anybody go with you? Alicia Owen. If this indeed were left out of the grand jury proceedings, then I am totally shocked and, and angry beyond words. Here it is, so to speak, the smoking gun that they could go out and verify, the corroboration, in other words, the linkage to King that was denied. Cover up. Organized, planned, deliberate cover up. The courthouse, Wahoo, Nebraska. The hearings begin. Alicia Owen is ready to testify. So too is Paul Bonassi. But there is no sign of Troy Bonner. De Camp discovers that Robert Siegler has sent the young man a threatening subpoena. Fearing arrest for perjury, Troy has gone into hiding. Let's try and subpoena my brother's guy. Is Troy okay? Yeah. yeah, he's okay. I'm just not going to have him testify until after he does. In court, the camp successfully pleads for another adjournment. The county attorney's office begins to search for Troy Bonner, but Robert Siegler won't say why. I'll ask you whether you're about to charge Troy Bonner with perjury. Oh, well, thank you. Why isn't the coming, Mr. Siegler? You're a public official, aren't you? Mr. Siegler, is it true you are about to charge Troy Bonner with perjury? No, Mr. Mr. Siegler, if you do not charge Troy Bonner with perjury, does that mean you accept his, what he's saying is true? No, can I Why not try to have Troy Bonner summoned to this hearing, Mr. Siegler? No, can I Why no comment, Mr. Siegler? No, can Every victim witness who stepped forward in any way or even was a potential witness that somebody heard about has either been killed, put in jail under some theory or other, terrified or run out of the state, discredited. Every perpetrator, every perpetrator, even the convicted ones, have been treated as conquering heroes. Obviously, the FBI was protecting 
something a lot more significant than a bunch of old pedophiles having improper relations with little boys. They were protecting something a lot more significant than a bunch of drug peddlers. They were protecting, in my opinion, they were protecting some very prominent politicians, some very powerful and wealthy individuals associated with those politicians and the political system up to and including the highest uh, political people in this entire country. In search of answers, John DeCamp goes to Washington to investigate Larry King's powerful connections in the nation's capital. Paul Bonassi has come too. Larry King threw child sex parties at his $5,000 a month Washington house. Paul Bonassi was one of the victims. Larry King's house down in Washington, D.C. Was, was, was a nice house. It was on what they, I guess, I believe it was Embassy Row because that's what they kept uh, talking about. There were a lot of flags from different countries when you drove around in the area. So tell me, Paul, how often did you come here? I was about 14, about 1981. And at first it was about three or four times the first year. After that, it was about once a month after 81. And who brought you here? Larry King brought me here. And this is the actual house where you... Yes. And what, you were used for sex there? Yes. Some of the parties when they started off were straight political type parties with no sex. And then when some of the men had left, some of the politicians had left, the ones that had planned, they had planned on uh, engaging in some type of sexual activity, uh, that would come after the party. Some of the kids would be held downstairs in some of the rooms where if they acted up or if they started freaking out because of the drugs that they were on, they'd put them in a room that they couldn't get out of and they'd lock them in. Were there drugs at these parties? Yes. What kind of drugs? Anything you wanted. Cocaine, uh, heroin, speedballs. You're uh, telling me those speed. things were at these parties where you had Larry King and prominent politicians? Yes. Were they readily available to anybody at the party? They... At the after parties they were readily available for anybody beforehand they did it more uh, upstairs than they did anywhere else, and it was kind of in the back rooms. Were any attempts ever made that you know of to, uh, to expose this situation? As far as I know, nothing's ever been done, and most of the people that were in there had already been, I guess you say, compromised. King's partner in sex crime was powerful Washington lobbyist Craig Spence. He took youngsters like Bonassi on midnight tours of the White House. So you were in the White House then? Yes. And how, how did you gain access? Well, I came down with uh, Larry King, but Craig Spence was the one that arranged the trip for us. And it was kind of a, a gift for our services that we were doing. How many times were you on this kind of a trip? I came to it on two times. Two times? And were you used for sex on those occasions? None until after we left. After you left the White House? Yes. Yeah. What time of night? It was usually around uh, midnight. To me, it was just kind of weird being in the White House at that time of the night and getting to go into places that the guy was telling us that uh, nobody gets to go to. I mean, we've seen, I've seen rooms in there that uh, I'd never even heard about. Craig Spence and Larry King had a couple of groups. One was called Bodies by God, and they had the Cowboys. And there was another group that was started by Larry King, which was called the Golden Boys, which was kids that were usually under the age of approximately 10. On the trail of Craig Spence, DeCamp finds the investigative reporter who exposed Spence's callboy network, Paul Rodriguez of the Washington Times. We had uh, uncovered... Uh a series of allegations from some miners and it led me to a callboy operation here in Washington. It sure fits with, you know, this boy Paul Benassi. I mean, he tells a tale of being brought to the to the, the White House on occasion, kind of as a reward for the kid. Craig Spence is dead. He committed suicide. He had advanced stages of AIDS. He was an AIDS carrier and he killed himself. 
this was the thing that always bothered me. They claimed it was the largest uh, male prostitution ring in the city that they've ever, ever had uncovered. It was a million dollars a year minimum. Yeah. And yet they only prosecuted the operator, uh, Henry Vinson, and three of his lieutenants, as it were. Mm -hmm. They never went after any of the Johns or the clients. This operation, which was, again, quite large, claimed to have clients that ran from the White House to the Capitol Hill to the State House to the churches to, in, within the media. Um, and that's and precisely of, what Paul describes as the people he was with. And a lot of the stuff led there, but we couldn't quite nail it at all cases because, again, to accuse someone of high yeah. stature, you've got to be very careful. I understand. We were able to do it through the, uh, the, the mother load which provided us credit card receipts and canceled checks and then um, lists of the clients. The prosecutors knew all this stuff. There was approximately 20,000 pieces of doc or 20,000 documents yes. that they had. They sealed the entire record when they found out I was accessing it. They required consent agreements from all the lawyers, all the clients, all the relatives of all the clients, all the hookers, including the clients themselves. Which means you can never gain access. They sealed them by court order. And we have tried, to, we've attempted on several occasions to unseal that, and we've been told it will be a cold day in hell before those records ever get unsealed. And it makes me wonder what's in those records. Yeah. The Attorney General is now involved. Bill Colby has passed the camp's evidence to a senior lawyer in the Justice Department. He did say that the Attorney General's office would be very sensitive to any charges of abuse of children, that this was a matter of considerable priority to the department, that this sort of thing not take place, and that they would assign an officer to look into the case. For John DeCamp, the story of Larry King's corrupt empire holds a dire warning for America. If you can control about three or four key elements, you can totally own a state, you can make right wrong, you can make truth falsehood, falsehood truth. If you control the media, if you control the Justice Department, if you control the police, you own the system. It's beyond belief that arguably the most powerful person in the world, the President of the United States, in the form of Richard Nixon, could not prevent the investigation of Watergate, or that President Reagan could not prevent the investigation of Iran-Contra, and yet somehow this group of unnamed, unknown, anonymous individuals in Omaha, Nebraska have such power they can control and protect all of these people from being investigated. Those allegations are ridiculous. Well, first of all, Nixon did cover up Watergate, number one. Bush did cover up Iran-Contra, at least officially. And Omaha has successfully covered up this situation. In each case, it was the press that exposed the problem. It wasn't institutions of government. They had been corrupted. They had been compromised. They were the ones doing the cover-up. The Justice Department, acting through FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Omaha, emerges from the record of the Franklin investigation, not so much as a party to the cover-up, but as its coordinator. Rigging grand juries, harassment of witnesses, incitement to perjury, and tampering with evidence, federal personnel were seen to apply all those techniques in the Franklin case.